Innovation. We all hear this word, right? Pick up a newspaper, pick up a magazine. If you're listening to the president speak, everyone is talking about innovation. And the fact is, it's a hot topic, right? It's what is creating jobs. It's what gives all of us a reason to show up every day for work. And the reason why it's so important, when you start to look, at least in the consumer product space, is nearly 50% of revenue from companies is coming from products that are less than two years old. Quite astounding when you think about it. When we were all younger, products had a much longer shelf life. When you introduced a new product, it could last for four, five, six, ten years. But today, you always have to be bringing out something that's new and improved. You have to give consumers a reason to continue to buy your product. Because if not, you can lose market share. You've got to use innovation to stay in front of the competition. Because otherwise, your competition is going to take market share away from you. When you walk into a store today and you see something on the shelf and you buy it, if you're not satisfied with it, you bring it back. And so what retailers today have done is they've leveled the playing field. They've made it easier for a brand that you've never heard of before to take market share away from the most established brands. Vizio. Everyone's heard of them, right? Largest manufacturer of LCD TVs in the world. Yet 10 years ago, they didn't exist. But they existed because they launched their product at Costco. Costco's got a generous return policy. So shoppers would go into Costco, they would see Panasonic, they would see Sony, they'd see Vizio for a couple hundred dollars less. But people bought Vizio because they knew that if it didn't work, if it didn't dazzle them, if it didn't live up to expectations, they would just bring it back to Costco. They used that to gain market share. They used innovation to take market share away from the most established brands in consumer electronics to become the largest in their space. We need innovation today to keep the customers we already have. To keep our customers loyal, we have to give them a reason to continue to buy our brands. We also use innovation to make sure that we can get into new markets, that we can expand our brands, build brand equity. But in reality, innovation today is all about survival. When you hear things like innovate or die, there's reality to that, because if you are not bringing out new products to the marketplace, your time is short. So, when we talk about innovation, there's a lot of terms, a lot of ways to describe it, but the literal definition is the introduction of something new, or a new idea, method, or device. But I would challenge you that innovation is much more than that. Innovation is discovering what's possible. Dishwashing soap. Doesn't seem very innovative, is it? It's glycerin in water, it's sold in a plastic bottle. It's a commodity. Yet two guys decided that they could innovate in a category that was about as commodity as it gets. The process of washing dishes, pretty simple, right? Where do you keep your dishwashing soap? Under your sink, right? Why do you keep it under your sink? Well, it's not a very attractive looking bottle. So you open up the cabinets and guys, Hang with me here, I'll, I'll explain how dishwashing is done. Took me a while to learn too. You bend down and you open up the cabinets and you find a bottle and you lift it up and you flip the cap and you turn it over and you squirt it on a sponge or into the sink. You turn it back over, push the cap down, bend down, stick it under the cabinet, close the doors, and you start the process of washing dishes. It's been done like that for a very long time. But these two guys decided that they would disrupt that category. They hired a very famous industrial designer, Karim Rashid. They filed a patent on a valve that allowed the bottle to be upside down on the counter. So now you grab the bottle, you squirt, you put it down. It's faster. It looks better. Do you think it's cheaper? No, it's more expensive. Yet they were able to bring a more expensive product to market against established brands like Ivory, and generate hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue. That's innovation. Sometimes innovation is discovering what hasn't been invented, going beyond boundaries. Gore-Tex found a way to make a fabric that was waterproof. Great, that's already always been done. But they also figured out how to make that same waterproof fabric breathable. 
They seem to contradict, but yet they were able to do it. Sometimes innovation is answering a need that consumers don't even realize they need. How many people have a DVR or TiVo? Could you imagine life today without it? I mean, honestly. Yesterday, I'm at a hotel, and I'm watching Sports Center, and immediately the phone rings, and instinctively, I grab the remote to hit pause so I don't miss the highlights, only to realize I'm in a hotel, and I can't do that. It's changed our behavior, changes the way we interact with TV, or the way we program shows. And then sometimes innovation, just silly. Apparently, if you sew sleeves on a blanket, you can make a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, approaching a billion dollars in revenue. And you know there's monks out there right now sitting back and saying, we thought of this a thousand years ago. <laughs> the difference, someone followed through with the idea. They did it. All right, so when we talk about open innovation, great idea, great concept. Unfortunately, they weren't teaching it when I was in college. But we can thank Henry Chesbro for at least coining the term of open innovation, where he talks about open innovation as a paradigm that assumes that firms can go out and find outside ideas, external ideas, as well as internal ideas to advance their technology. But in reality, this has been going around for over 300 years. Back in the early 1700s, the English government, the British government, went out and they offered a prize, the Longitude Prize, to seamen who could go out and figure out the way to figure out the longitude of a ship. So it's been around for a long time, we just didn't have a catchy name for it or a really great book that we could generate sales off of. But in reality, there's a great story behind this whole open innovation movement. And that story really took shape when A.G. Lafley got behind it. A.G. Lafley, back in 1999, CEO of Procter & Gamble, largest consumer products company in the world, with one of the largest R&D departments in the world, said something amazing, and that was he wanted 50% of all new product ideas to come from outside of P&G. Now, as you can imagine, that was blasphemy. I mean, here's a company that for years had built their name on the great innovation that they did within their company. Their managers were compensated based on developments. Their researchers were compensated and bonused based on innovations. Yet he wanted half of their new products coming from outside of their company. But he did it because he believed that there were great ideas outside of the company. He also believed that they had strong brands, great distribution channels, and the ability to help their customers by bringing new products to market. So in 1999, they launched Connect and Develop. They said, bring us your ideas. And ideas started to flow in. In fact, since 1999, over 400 products have gone to market from Procter & Gamble that did not have their origin at P&G, including the Swiffer Sweeper. That came from outside of the company. It's a billion dollar brand. What's amazing is $10 billion in revenue. $10 billion in revenue that they have generated off of products that weren't invented here, that weren't invented in Cincinnati, Ohio. 